Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. All right, well, welcome to Meet the Author. My name is Joe Nash. Today we're talking to Eric Hage. You may know him from Metroland, but he does a lot, a lot of other things which we'll be hearing about. And he's written a book called The Words and Music of Van Morrison. And we're going to be hearing about that and about rock and roll music and the hist as a cultural thing. So welcome, Eric. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Well, before we start, um, I always like to ask people, give us the capsule biography. I know you're in the area and everything. Just tell us a little bit about yourself so people know who we are and everything. Well, I'm a journalism professor at SUNY Copeskill. Okay. And uh, I've been a music writer for about 10 years. Um, I started out working in radio, and um, I've written for the All Music Guide. I was a contributing writer to No Depression magazine for a number of years. And um, I've written for a bunch of publications. I uh, spent a lot of time building a platform before releasing the book. So fairly widely published music, music journalist, though I'm, I've sort of stepped out recently and I'm writing a book about a novelist right now. But you, you still write for Metroland, right? I do, yeah. I have um, a column for Metroland called The Major Lift, okay. which appears monthly. Well, the book, um, The Words and Music of Van Morrison, is part of a series, the Prager Singer-Songwriter Collection. And I'm just going to read some of the other people in this series to get an idea of what. And they're all called The Words and Music of. So we have The Words and Music of Sting, Tom Waits, Patti Smith, Neil Young. Prince, Paul Simon, John Lennon, David Bowie, Bruce Springsteen, Carole King, Frank Zappa, Stevie Wonder, and a few others. So tell us about this series, what it is, and uh, how maybe you got involved with that. Well, it's primarily a, a, a critical series. It, it's more analysis than biography. Though I think with my book and with most books, you'll find there's a, there's a biographical thread tying <laughs> things together. So really what we're dealing with is taking these artists who have these large catalogs and uh, Given the backstory to, to each song, to each album throughout their career, um, you know, a little bit of analysis, thinking about what was going on culturally at the time, uh, comparing them to other artists. Well, it says in the introduction to the whole series, not just to this one, but it's not just about the music, but lyrics too seem to be seem to be important to the to this whole series. Yeah, they really are. I mean, there's almost a, a literary criticism aspect to it. That's not the whole kit and caboodle, but part of it is looking closely at the themes and the motifs that the artists are talking about. And these are all artists with um, 20, 30 albums that have been around for a long time. So they're, they're people you can really probably you know, get a lot, a lot of cultural stuff out of, too. Yeah, they're really artists you can sink your teeth into, especially Van Morrison, because his catalog is so diverse. And he's covered so many genres. And uh, lyrically, he's covered so many motifs and so many things. He's dealt with uh, esoteric spirituality. He's dealt with philosophy. The um, list goes on and on. Well, that's, that would um, lead me to my first question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because I'm, I'm thinking of this series, Paul Simon, John Lennon, David Bowie, Prince, Carole King. They're, they're very definable artists in a certain way. I mean, they, they, not that they're not complex or they don't have other styles, but they're pretty definable, more or less. Yeah. And you write, I think, in a very first paragraph of your book that Van Morrison, he has over 40 albums. He has, he covers blues, soul, rhythm and blues, folk, country, gospel, rock, pop, jazz, big band, 1950s, doo-wop, new age, Christian hymns, I mean the list goes on, Irish folk, he has a skiffle album, spoken word, he has instrumentals, so then you just write, you get the point. So what, yeah. um, <laughs> why would you take this on? I mean, compared to the other artists, it's, how do you grapple with someone like this? And not only that, many of these styles are on one album. And then yeah. I've found it even more. When you hear all these things live, they're even different again from the, so how, how did you take, why take this guy on? Well, I think that's <laughs> the reason to do it. And I think, I, I don't know if I would have wanted to do any other artist but Van Morrison. I mean, it's really something, as a cultural critic, you can just sink your teeth into this because he has you know, s such a diverse range of things within his catalog. I mean, and that, that's the reason to do it, is because I'm interested in country. I'm interested in folk. I'm interested in jazz and blues. I'm interested in, in his heritage, uh, you know, the gospel of Mahalia Jackson or the folk of Lead Belly or the, the, the droning one chord blues of John Lee Hooker. I think that's precisely why you want to do Van Morrison. I mean, he's a fascinating artist. Um, in the beginning, you talk about um, 
you talk about um, blue, the blues is very important to Van Morrison, but not yeah. just Van Morrison, but um, a lot of the early um, mid 60s, um, the Yardbirds and the Who and all these guys. So why don't we start there and maybe you could talk about how all this American music influenced a lot of these what, who became very famous artists besides Van Morrison. But let's talk, can you talk about that? Because I know you write, sure, you write, you write yeah. a lot about American yeah, music. Yeah, well, well, we had the British invasion, which everyone knows of, but before that there was a reverse invasion. There was an American invasion of England where we had a lot of uh, young, middle-class, uh, white college guys in England who were listening to the blues records of Howlin' Wolf, uh, to Muddy Waters, all those chess records things. Um, like I said, the Yardbirds, the Pretty Things, the Rolling Stones. And then actually uh, Chris Barber, who Van Morrison would play with later on on the Skiffle Sessions, was actually not only a noted jazz musician, but he was a promoter. And he brought all these blues artists over to England to tour. And it really just lit the imagination of so many of those young guys who were... Uh, but I mean, even the Beatles talk about... They did a lot of rhythm, rhythm and blues and blues covers. And yeah, they weren't so directly blues. They did a lot of rhythm and blues. But uh, this, this older American music really lit the spark of early 60s British rock. So I think that's the foundation of it. So the British invasion really was American stuff coming back, maybe. <laughs> America's coming, uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was British guys coming over with American music. So, uh, so you, you, did Prager approach you for this book, or how, how did that work for the series? Did I, I approached them for the series and said, look, you know, I've been writing for a So you, you, you knew this series? And, and I knew the oh, series, okay. and uh, I approached the acquisitions editor, and I said, you know, here's, here's what I've done, and uh, you know, I spent a lot of time writing about music, and I'd like to write a book, and I'd like to write for you. And they said, great, you know, we'd like you to write for us. Who do you want to write about? And okay. I was just like, you know, I don't, well, <laughs> Van Morrison? <laughs> that, that's, that'd be my ultimate dream, to write about Van Morrison. They said, okay. great, go for it. Oh, okay. And well, that was it. Very good. Um, good. So how did you, um, like, start this? Tell us about how you started the process. I mean, again, we're, we're talking about someone who, a wide range of styles. I mean, I, the book is chronological. You sort of start with his... Well, once you start, he started out. Um, yeah, t t talk about how he started out. Maybe you could. How he started out? What? Well, yeah. how I started out? No, how Van Morrison started out. Well, yeah. Van Morrison. I mean, he had a very busy performing career before them. I mean, he was in all these uh, Irish show bands, which were which are basically uh, kind of like cover bands. You had a, a bunch of guys, multi instrumentalists. You had horns, you had guitars, and they sort of dressed in suits, and they would go play matching suits. Yeah. Matching suits. <laughs> yeah, and short haircuts, and they would play uh, the hits of the day at dance halls. So he was, a, he was a professional musician, actually, very early on in, okay. in his adolescence. And people usually start their history of Van Morrison with them, you know, the, who, wrote, who had Gloria and Here Comes a Night. I but should say the group them, in case people... Uh, the group them, <laughs> yeah, that, sorry, the group them. Uh, the, the 1960s group them in which he started, the Belfast group. But he w had a lucrative professional performing career on stage long before he joined the band them. Okay, and then... I guess we should start his first album, um, an album called Astral Weeks. You write about this, um, what you, 1968 to 1974, yeah. as the golden age of Van Morrison and Astral Weeks and Moon Dance, a lot of things people probably know yeah. about. So, why don't you talk about this Astral Weeks? Because actually, now in 2009, your book ends in 2008, but yeah. Astral Weeks was his first famous album, and now he just put it out again as a live version at age, how old is he, 63? 63. So yeah. talk about this first album that made such a impression, not just on people, but on the whole rock and roll world. Well, Astro Weeks is a, is a funny album because, I mean, there's, nothing, there's been nothing like it before or since. I mean, it's, it's this amazing, otherworldly, beautiful album, but um, it doesn't seem to have any direct influences, and it doesn't seem to have any relationship to what was going on at that time in the late 60s. And it was kind of the situation where uh, Lou Marenstein, the producer, took this young guy, you know, Van Morrison, who's in his early 20s, pretty, pretty rough guy, pretty green, and he sticks him in the studio with these very sophisticated jazz musicians, and these songs, which are pretty much, I mean, they're fairly rudimentary songs, they're like, you know, two or three chords, yeah. and uh, just the, the, sticking him in there with these jazz musicians who sort of improvise around these wonderful songs, these poetic interludes, a lot of them about Belfast, I think created this one-off, this thing that could never happen again, this beautiful kind of synergy. Well, you, you, you write his um, Van Morrison writing about um, Belfast akin to James Joyce and Dublin and... Um, William Kennedy. William and Kennedy in Albany and yeah. William and Faulkner in, I can never say that place that he writes about. Yakna Patafa. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so he's, he's constantly mining 
the his early um, life there. I mean, as you can see, you, which you talk about in the book, these Belfast memories go on through his whole his whole career. Yeah, it gave him this albums. it gave him this poetical storehouse that he never exhausted. I mean, he still. Uh, uh, in 2002, down the road, was talking. He had that song, Chopping Wood. Mm -hmm. About his father. About his dad, a, a Presbyterian electrician on the docks, the Harlan and Wolf docks in Belfast. And he seems to always return to Belfast in song. So it's amazing that he came out of Belfast, you know, with this complete poetical storehouse and this complete foundation as a professional playing musician. It, it seems like his hometown gave him a lot more than. A lot of artists' hometowns give them. I think the Beatles are comparable, and that yeah, Liverpool yeah. created, gave them a whole mythology. Well, um, one thing that you, you bring up in your book several times is that in the late '60s, early '70s, so many artists were very political or mm -hmm. commenting on what was going on in the world. And Van Morrison, even for someone of his stature, and he was Moon Dance album was a big bestseller and all that, yeah. but he never really comments on social events is that no. what do you what do you make of that I he's <laughs> apolitical and i think as i thought about it after i finished writing the book and had sent it off for production i i talked about two different things i talked about him never talking about the politics of the time and i also talked about him never talking about the troubles in belfast and i think it's related i think because of his roots um, and, and being essentially a, a protestant person in northern belfast mm. i think that's why he he, he stays fairly mum involving politics, and I think it comes from coming from such a troubled region of sectarian violence and political upheaval. I think it's just ingrained to be sort of mute on those issues. And he obviously, one thing that comes through in your book very clear is his own sort of inner personal spiritual quest that probably is still going on, like most of us. But yeah. So that's how maybe why he didn't write about it. So why don't you talk about, um, well, let me, let me just ask you one more question, because you write, um, you teach mass media mm -hmm. and cultural criticism, I guess you say. This era when um, Astral Weeks came out, um, 1968 to 74, say, not just in Van Morrison, but, you know, can you talk about that sort of as the music, what the music meant, or, and I, you think people, when they, rock and roll started, it was going to be this cultural force. How, what do you yeah. think about how important music became to that era? Not just Van Morrison, but... Well, in yeah. terms of mass media, I mean, movies had always been, and television had always been a step ahead of music before this. And then with the revolution in the late 60s and early 70s... Did, you mean just all cultural... Everything? In terms of just sell numbers, yeah. like selling, you know, the yeah. bottom line. It, it, movies had been ahead of, uh, of albums. And of course, before the, the album craze of the, of the 60s, we had primarily singles. And so then we see in the late 60s and the early 70s, you see LPs, albums, suddenly outpacing all other forms of mass media. It becomes the powerful medium that we know music is nowadays. I mean, album albums, music albums became the number one cultural what, yeah. artifact. Or whatever. Yeah, it became you know, multi, the multi-million dollar industry we know it is nowadays, but it wasn't always that way. And it was those, those, those landmark albums of the late 60s and early 70s, you know, the Rolling Stones, of course, uh, the Beatles, who obviously ended in 69, but... Um, Van Morrison's albums, uh, Neil Young's albums. Uh, mm -hmm. These are albums that people still reference today as some of the greatest albums of all time. And Bob Dylan. Of course, Bob Dylan, yeah. Joni Mitchell also. I mean, we could probably, the list would go on probably. Yeah. But, um, but that period was, was really when albums and music leaped to the fore as, I think, the most powerful medium out there. Um, well, your um, book does talk about this. And let me just stay in the 68 to 74 period, this golden age. So after Astral Weeks, we have Moon Dance, and we have a, a very famous live album called It's Too Late to Stop Now. Why don't you talk about Moon Dance and that, and that album, sort of in the context of the Van Cannon, I guess you could well, <laughs> well, Moon Dance... Everyone knows Moon Dance. I yeah, think. Moon Dance is a great... It's not just a song. It's, it's an album. A lot of people don't know that. But it's an interesting album because Astral Weeks... For all the critical success, we still cite it nowadays as one of the great albums of all time, did not sell a lot, and Van Morrison was essentially starving. So the question was, how could he maintain his uh, artistic strength, but hedge that with some kind of commercial success? So the answer was Moondance. And what he did with Moondance, if you study his, his history, is he actually went back to the Irish show band period. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that thing we think of as, a, as the soul format, with all the horns and the big band. And which is also probably crowd-pleasing. <laughs> Very crowd-pleasing. I mean, those were show-stopping shows uh, in the early 70s. Um, 
but so Moondance was an, it was, it was an attempt by Van Morrison to be able to feed himself, to, be, to make money, but also to know that he made something that was artistically strong, and he completely succeeded. I mean, it, it balances those two things perfectly. Um, and then the, the, the band that built up around that, as you mentioned, was an incredible live experience, and it's too late to stop now. Um, this is the era of the double live album. Yes, and this is the year of the double live <laughs> the album. Double and, live album. And it's too late to stop now is one of the defining double live albums. I mean, this is the age of indulgence. You know, yeah. the, the big gatefold sleeve and the, the, the two large vinyl LPs. You know, I always, my, I always feel like my students are going to ask me, you know, tell us again about <laughs> vinyl LPs, Grandpa. You know, <laughs> or these cassettes. Well, this live album like many of the other ones, doesn't have a 20-minute drum solo, too, so that's okay. No, it doesn't. <laughs> and, so, and, and a lot of it is, you know, it, it's, it's, it's this beautiful soul music, and it's paying tribute to his hero, Sam well, there's Cooke. Many, there's many covers on, on, um, on that live album. There are. Uh, uh, Ray Charles songs and you know, Bobby, Bobby Blue Bland, Bland and, all and those guys. Sam Cooke, Bring It On Home, to me, it's like just amazing version. I know. I, I think I had that album in high school. I, I think I just wore it out. I played it so much. But <laughs> I still play it. I was listening to it on the way over here, actually. On the, uh, and, but now they're on CDs, but that's a whole nother. And iTunes. <laughs> and I, um, so, so this, in your book, again, you, you allude to this as the golden age of Ann Morrison. And the rest of the book obviously chronicles up to this year, practically. And I, I sense from your book you, you see this as his as his peak, it, or maybe artistically, is that safe? To, I mean, I, you do like a lot of it, but yeah. What? What? I think that's the that, that that's the popular opinion, and I acknowledge that in the book. Um, and I think in terms of a, con a condensed multi-year period where he's doing a lot of quality stuff, it is his peak. But I would pull out something like uh, Avalon Sunset, and I pull off a song off that, uh, you know, Orange Field, mm -hmm. as one of his greatest songs of all time. Um, no guru, no method, no teacher had wonderful moments. So I think he's had high points throughout his career, but that's a real just condensed period. So even if, he had, if his career had ended in 74, he still would have been considered one of the greatest of all time. I think so, yeah. It's hypothetical, but I, think, I do oh, yeah. think so. I think it's such a strong period of music that he left us with. So then now, why don't we talk about the, um, the rest of the book covers, obviously, from 74 on. There's, there's a three-year period which you call the, the Great Pause. Yeah. So, <laughs> his, his and, then he, and then, of course, he started making albums again in 78, right up, uh, almost one a year, right up until 2009. Isn't so. it weird that I actually have to call a three-year period between albums a hiatus? When most <laughs> artists, that's, that's standard. I know, but, but he's never stopped releasing albums. I was reading an article in Rolling Stone about Bob Dylan, the, the new cover story, and they were saying he has 33 albums, and I thought, Ben Morrison has more than that. I know. Well, if you, you're not even counting the compilations and all that. No, all the rehashing so he must have compilations. Fit, he probably has over 50. Um, so what, tell us about this little three-year period, and then maybe we can go on to the, the 80s, I guess. Yeah, well, the, the three-year period was, I think he, he reached probably, I don't want to, you want to speak for him, but it, it looked like he reached a period of burnout. I mean, if you look at, if you listen to a lot of the bootlegs from that time, if you watch, you know, the um, Live at Montreux concert from 74, mm. it looks like someone who's reached a real impasse and who, really had to step back and see what he was doing and come back out. But during that impasse, he did perform Caravan on the band's last waltz. That's right. And, and that's, the, that's the best performance on that, yeah, on that disc. Yeah. <laughs> we call it discs now. But it was, I mean, he was wearing a horrible outfit. But I mean, it just, he just showed how he could just take the stage and just still dominate. Um, well, and so the next period, I guess, or one thing I should tell people, you know, we're talking about the periods of Van Morrison here, but you, you analyze, you go through album by album, you yeah. talk a lot about, almost every song is mentioned a little bit, and yeah. it's, it's great, you know, analysis and good, good insight into, again, Van Morrison's music, but I think rock and roll mm -hmm. in general. So I guess the next phase, I guess the, the 80s known as the spiritual quest phase, but right before that there was this wavelength tour when I think he really was going for, he was really going for to be commercial. Yeah. And then I think either that fizzled out or didn't work out, then he went on this. Yeah, thing, so I, Wavelength was, was definitely a stab at commercial success, to returning him to the... I mean, just the whole thing, the way the cover, the picture, you know, the whole thing. Was yeah, it was like a, <laughs> I, I described it as a GQ shot in there. It's, it's the one glamorous shot of Van Morrison ever, I think. And, uh, but then... And he was on Saturday Night Live then, and it, was, yep. I, it's, it seemed like he was going to really break out and be, uh, what a, something he probably never wanted to be, a popular... Uh, 
Yeah, it seemed like it, and uh, it just it just didn't work. And uh, then he backed up with Into the Music from 1979. And I think I compare Into the Music to Moondance because I think again he found a balance between a great artistic success, you know, great songs, but something that was also very appealing to people. And I think um, for me anyway, I'm a big Van Morrison fan. People watching, you can probably tell, but from 1979 that album, um, Into the Music, yeah. up until A Night in San Francisco, 1994, to me, that is the period that I really like. The, I mean, I like everything, of course, but yeah. that's the period that I really like a lot. So this, this, this 80s music, or um, I guess you could, spiritual quest to fair to... Yeah, he was, he was doing a lot of reading. I mean, in, Van Morrison is a very, not formally educated, but very intelligent, very intellectually curious person. And... He was reading these esoteric writings about spirituality. Um, you know, Alice Bailey. Um, he was even dabbling in Scientology. Mm. Um, he was reading uh, the, the Rosicrucians. You know, he was really uh, thinking through these diverse types of spirituality. But the problem for me in the early '80s was that I felt like there was a kitchen sink approach in lyrics to what he was doing. He didn't have that strong impressionistic lyrical bent, but he would throw in all these philosophical ideas that he was wrestling with. Just yeah, just. Like almost uh, as a list, and just see what would happen. Yeah, it was like this is what's going on in my mind right now, and and he dedicated uh, inarticulate speech of the heart to L. Ron Hubbard, which uh, with the Scientology yeah. guru, which really raised a lot of eyebrows. <laughs> but then he was off. Then he was done with that. And he was off to the next thing. So you uh, see a very roving. Many many times, and when you mention this in the book, by the time an album of his came out, he was into something else. Yeah, and people would go to a concert and. They were expecting that it was, it was not what they were there for. <laughs> yeah, he's a very roving kind of nomadic approach. I mean, he's just a very intellectually curious guy with a very uh, keen intelligence, and he's just on to new things all the time. Well, one thing that you, um, you, you talk about in your book a lot, and I don't know how he, Van Morrison's music, he, he try, you talk about meditation and trying to get into a meditative state or trying to have music heal you, not yeah. just heal himself as he's performing, but somehow make the listener be healed in some way or to get into a meditative state. And it's, it's sort of a, what do you, th talk about that a little bit, because it's, to me, that's the period that I like a lot. And it's, yeah. I think. Well, he, he, he's done a lot of reading over the years about uh, music as a healing medium, and he became very interested in that. But what does he mean by healing? I, I, to become a whole person, to be... I don't. I mean, it, it pops up. I mean, it pops up earlier and later too. If you think about, and the healing has begun yeah, from into the music. Then he has an album in 1997, The Healing Game. Mm -hmm. So he's constantly thinking about the effect, the impact of the on the listener of it being a palliative sort of effect. And it's interesting if you. I know you've talked to a lot of Van Morrison fans, and I have too. So many people talk about uh, coming to Van Morrison's music in a time of crisis or need, oh, yeah. or when they, and, and it's sort of we're helping them through. I mean, we have lots of stories about all kinds of music doing this. Um, then Lester Bangs, the, the late rock critic, has that essay about Astro Weeks, how it came to him in a time when he oh, was yeah. in complete despair. So I think uh, people have a, a lot of anecdotes about that, and I think Van Morrison is constantly thinking about how can this music create a, a meditative state in the listener, or how can this music be somehow healing to the listener, which is an interesting paradox if you think about his personality, because I know, we know him as a very <laughs> cantankerous person with a very sometimes confrontational relationship with his public, but he creates this beautiful music, yeah, which is often meant to heal. Well, in your book, and many people have done this, when you talk about Van Morrison, the word paradox comes up, because yeah. you're right. How can this sort of grumpy old, you know, <laughs> And yet, you go to a concert and you come out feeling euphoric or whatever. Yeah. You feel like you went through something that made you feel better. <laughs> yeah. And yet, then you read about him, or whether it's true or not, what you read in the press. But you know, he writes about that too. But yeah. how can this old grumpy guy be be doing that? It's it is sort of a paradox. That's the great thing, and it also makes it more real for me because you have so many artists who have these very uh, vivid personae, like David Bowie or Mick Jagger, but. Van Morrison doesn't work so much on being a rock star or a celebrity or having a great persona, but his, his music, it's all about the music. Well, in, in the end there, you, you do mention at the very end of the book, um, it's, it's his utter humanity that, yeah. that um, he's so human, I guess you could say, and he, I guess he expresses it in, um, in his music. Um, 
So the, the spiritual quest phase went through several albums. And then I guess he went into, I guess he hooked up with Georgie Fame then. I can, yeah. I can tell people who he is. And then how that, from 89 to yeah. like 94, was a whole other fantastic period too. <laughs> Ge Georgie Fame was a, you know, he was a star in England in the early 60s. He you know, had a hit, sort of jazz, jazzy guy. Yeah. And uh, like Cliff Richard, who uh, Van Morrison worked with briefly. So he was going through a period where he was kind of, he's working with a lot of people who were stars when he was young in the early 60s. But Georgie Fame turned out to be this amazing uh, band leader for him. He led his band, uh, uh, a co-vocalist, um, a keyboardist for him that he had, still has on board. I mean, Georgie Fame seems to be his Guy Friday yeah. and really congealed things for him at a time when I, when I think he needed that. Well, I think they both have a lot of the same influences. They liked a lot of the same people when they were younger, and they both had this vast knowledge of... And if you hear some of the shows from them, like live shows, they can just go in and do a Ray Charles song, and it yeah. just burns the house down almost. It's it great. I mean, and there's a famous... What was the video? It's called The Concert. It was recorded in New York City from 89. It was just a... I don't know that one. Okay, no. it, was a, it was in... Um, famous, it was in New York City in 1989, but they made a movie out of it, it was great, and you know, yeah. Georgie Fame is on there and everything, and um, um, let's see. So that's another great period, and again, I, I keep saying the book really covers all these albums, the, all the songs, all, um, all these periods, and then I guess after the 90s, and I guess the big band, he did these big band things, yeah. oh, uh, then he went into another phase, I guess, what would you call the where he started really being more looking back to the 50s kind of music and doo-wop and yeah he had, a, he had a skiffle album which is from the 50s he had the healing game there's a lot of doo-woppy songs and yeah the late 90s he, he and down the road is really yeah. very 50 sounding and yeah there's a lot of he did a lot of things that sounded like doo-wop um even on uh, early early in the new millennium like what's wrong with this picture there's yeah. stuff on there that sounds very doo-wop-ish um, but he was also pulling on a lot of different forms he was pulling on jazz uh, he did that album of Moe's Allison songs yeah, uh. with Georgie Fame. Um, and again, back to the Georgie Fame thing, I think the, the interaction between them on stage is amazing, like on Van Lowe's Stairway, yeah. which is a song uh. from the early 80s, but they're, the way they sing together is just unbelievable. But I think he continued to have that sort of roving, nomadic approach throughout the 90s and into the early in the new millennium. Uh, and he did the album with Linda Gale Lewis. That's another like a country kind of album. Rockabilly country yeah. kind of thing. That's and uh, he just... He just pulls from everywhere. I mean, you can't, I don't know too many genres uh, that he hasn't touched upon. Is there an, I mean, I'm trying to think, is there an artist that does so many styles? I mean, if you really think about it, I, I can't really think of, <laughs> of any. I can't. I can't, I, I can't think of any at all. As I was going through this, I was, I was confronting the same question. I can't think of anybody who has done, I mean, a Skiffle album. I mean, Skiffle is really something we can't relate to over here in the States. I mean, the impact over there was something like Rockabilly in the US. Oh, yeah. And of course, Jimmy Page and The Who and The Beatles came from skiffle groups, from the skiffle craze of the late 50s in England. But it's a very obscure thing. So for him to say, all right, my next marketable album is <laughs> with Lonnie Donegan, and it's going to be a skiffle album live. But that's uh, a good album. It's a wonderful album. It's a great for singing along. It's all songs people probably know, Good yeah. Night Irene, but that's a skiffle. Skinner Blues, yeah. yeah I, I, it's, a very fun, it's a fun album, really. You can tell that he was having a good time during that. Um, well, it's one thing that is interspersed through a lot of the albums. I mean, I, I know we're trying to go in order, but it's hard to do. It's hard yeah. to do. On several of his albums, he has what um, these spoken word. I don't know what they are. Are they meditations? Is it poetry? And there's like a little music in the background, and he just sort of speaks. There's Coney Island. Story. Yeah. What? What do you? Um, again, this is another aspect to him. What? To me, I think I, I love some of these. I mean, what? What yeah. do you? What do you make of, that, of them? <laughs> I don't know. I think part of it is that meditative thing, but I think part of it is also um, placing himself in a lineage of Irish poetry. I think lyrics sometimes have to fit, right. rhyme right. They have to work with a the song. They have to work rhythmically. They have to make rhythmic sense. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes he just wants to really indulge uh, just pure poetry. Well, it's almost like stream of consciousness where he's... He's just talking about what it was like being young and growing up and listening yeah. to the radio and the breeze coming through the window. And it's almost like these... Yeah, on Hindford Street. What's the word that you used? Epiphanic. Is it, no, it's Epiphanic. A, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, he, the, he tries to capture these epiphanies he's had in life. And yeah, and it's back, it's back to Belfast again. He, 
those, for some reason, he lived, I mean, he lived in a pretty ordinary area on a, on a small street of row houses in, in a pretty, you know, not impoverished, but a few notches above impoverished section of Belfast. But for him, it was, he represents it as a fantastical wonderland. And mm -hmm. he talks a lot about being a child and walking down Cypress Avenue and all of a sudden having this elevated feeling, yeah, just like a, this epiphanic feeling. And he returns to that again and again and again in song. I mean, how many times does he walk down Cypress Avenue? He walked down it yeah. in Madame George. He walked down it in Cypress yeah. Avenue. He walked down it and the healing has begun. You know, you walk down the avenue again. Yeah. So all these childhood experiences are, are epiphanic. And he talks about it in Hindford Street. It's the sense memory of all those childhood things, uh, you know, the beachy river. Yeah, I mean, it's like um, sometimes how a a smell or a sound can just evoke a humongous memory in you, and all of a sudden he, he, he kind of does this in a lot of these. Yeah, and I think it also speaks to the fact that music is his medium. I don't think he has any other medium. He doesn't... Unlike, I think you mentioned near the end here in the book, um, all these other artists in, in this series, Paul Simon, John Lennon, yeah. Bowie, Bob Marley, Carol, they do Tom Waits, Sting. They, they have other outlets. Yeah. They write books, they're in movies, they do other things. Yeah. Then what you, he really doesn't have anything else. He doesn't. If he's got something to say, it's going to be in a song. Um, if he's angry at the press or if he's angry at the record industry, he's going to write a song. Well, that's one thing we didn't cover. And in your book, <laughs> and uh, you know, he has so many songs about the music industry and how it's terrible and being famous and how it's terrible being famous. And I mean, you, you could make a whole box set of... Why must I always explain? <laughs> uh, yeah. You could, there could be a whole box set of his... Complaint songs. Complaint songs, yeah. really. Um, but he really had that, he, you really don't get a sense that he has anything else. And you, you do cover that in the book. Um, well, we've come full circle because we, taught, we started out talking about the Astro Weeks album. And now in 2009, Maybe, have you heard the Astro Weeks live? At the Hollywood Bowl? Yeah. yeah. Maybe you could talk about that because we've been all over the place here. We didn't, but I think people watching will get a good sense of what his music's about. But talk about how this 40 years later, yeah. now he's doing it live at age, he's 63 now, I think. Or, yeah, or he just turned 63. You know. So it's, it's, he's did, he did the Astro Weeks, what, the same order of the songs and only... He, he moved the order around a little bit and he added um, Listen to the Lion from St. Okay. Dominic's That's preview, right. which I think fits in terms of being another impressionistic, mm -hmm. avant-garde kind of song. And he did, um, oh, the song from uh, Common One. Uh, so I think Summertime, Summertime in England. Summertime in England. Yeah, okay. he added that. Um, but the Astro Weeks has been this enchanting album that critics have you know, drooled over for so many years. And he almost kind of begrudged yeah. us that. <laughs> he, he sort of almost said, well, I don't understand why everyone's fascinated with that album. I don't oh, understand yeah. why they call it a rock album. It's not rock. And uh, guys like Connie Kay and Jay Berliner, they're great for one album, but, you know, you, it's, it's a one-time kind of thing. It's very samey throughout. But, so he's kind of steered away from the Astro, music, Astro Week's music over the years. And I think finally, late, you know, late in life, he's decided to finally return to it and to give it to us, you know, in one whole package yeah. in these concerts, just playing... He does a set, he does a normal set, then he does the Astro Weeks set. He brings on the remaining living members who okay, played with that. him. Connie K. original album. Okay. Yeah, Connie K's dead. Richard Davis on bass, um, Jay Broner on, on guitar. And uh, I think the sets are remarkable. It's, it's a great live experience. Does it match the original? You know, of course not. I mean, yeah. He's a different kind of singer. I mean, his register is so much lower. Um, some of the arrangements are slightly different. Um, but in and of itself, I think... Well, the album, the live album that just came out this year, Live at the Hollywood Bowl, I think is a great, great okay. Van Morrison album. I've heard some of it. I haven't heard the whole thing yet. Yeah. Well, how can we, we've been talking about the paradoxical nature of Van Morrison and his range of influences and music is just so wide. How could, how can Van Morrison be summed up, if he could, I mean. <laughs> and I have to just say, your book, for people watching, the book really gives a good sense of all the stuff we've been talking about, you go through all the albums, you mention all the songs and what the lyrics could possibly mean, what he was into, but how could you, because you, know, you don't really sum it all up in the book, how, yeah. how, could you sum it, how could you sum this artist up? I mean, in I think Van Morrison, and I, I say something like this in the book, I think he strikes emotional chords in us consistently, more consistently than other artists, and he strikes emotional chords in us that other artists can't get to. I think that's the bottom line. I think, I don't, 
I don't wonder what the Rolling Stones are going to do next. Yeah. You know, and I haven't been really moved by anything they've done in years. Um, uh, but Van Morrison, I mean, weddings are consecrated to Van Morrison. <laughs> you know, the songs throughout his catalog, whether it's Moondance, How I Told You Lately, yep. Lately, Someone Like You, Someone Like You, featured in Bridget Jones' Diary. Well, many um, of the songs are in movies, too. Over 150 of Van Morris, uh, over 150 popular Hollywood movies have a Van Morrison yeah. song in them. So you have to wonder. And I mean, you say in there, tell, you, tell people what you, you wrote about how these songs sometimes strike more emotion than the movie that, than the movie that it's in. Yeah, I think, I think <laughs> sometimes the songs are really uh, strike a mo more emotional chords than the actual movie itself. And some of these directors, like Martin Scorsese, yeah. these, aren't, these aren't amateurs. They're saying, look, I, I'm an auteur, and the perfect music for what I'm trying to do, my vision, is a Van Morrison yeah. song. And I think that says a lot about him. So even though I think he's impossible to sum up because he's done so much and has been so diverse, and he'll do something next year that will surprise us, oh, yeah. I know. I think he is the most uh, emotional of artists. Well, going back to one other quick thing before we start, and um, you mentioned how many of the songs you are at weddings, and I've been to many yeah. weddings where a song, but even last summer I went to a wedding of a young couple in their mid mid twenties, yeah. and the first song they danced to was um, "Crazy Love," That's a, yeah, from the Moon Dance album. So I think they weren't even born then. I know some of my students are. <laughs> Some of my students are citing songs like that. I have a student who constantly says, oh, our song is Crazy Love. Really? Yeah. And he's, 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 he's gone through renaissance after renaissance after renaissance. In 1990, when they released The Best of Van Morrison, A New Generation Discovered Him. Okay. Last year, in 2008, this little album with, with very little uh, press fanfare, with no single, Keep It Simple, was his first top 10 LP ever. In, in 40, 40 years, probably. In over 40, 40 albums. And it was the in first 40 albums in almost 50 years. It was his first one in the top 10. His first LP yeah. in the top 10. He, right. Now, people out there would say, I, I don't believe that, but yeah. a lot, his albums have sold a lot over a long period of time. Okay, so They're slow burners. Yeah. They, they stay on the racks. But never has one of his LPs entered the top 10. And so Keep It Simple, soon after it was released in 2008, shot into the top 10. I don't see too many artists who could do that. I, I don't yeah. think Paul McCartney could do that. I don't think Neil Young could do that. Um, it just shows that people are really waiting and, for more Van Morrison music. And then one thing you also say in the book that you just said a minute ago, um, we may not go back and listen to uh, Rolling Stones or everybody, but you, you go back to the Van Morrison albums, you say, people mm -hmm. go back and listen to them. You can still get something out of them when you're 53 years old, as opposed to. <laughs> or 40, yeah. <laughs> um, well, Eric, this has been great. I um, really appreciate it. The book is called The Words and Music of Van Morrison. We do have it in our library here. Um, but Eric probably wouldn't mind if you bought one. You can get it at what? Uh, on Am Amazon. On Amazon. Yeah. But if people are interested in this book, you can come in and check it out and listen to some Van Morrison songs. And Eric has just given us a great overview. So hopefully if you're watching, you'll maybe want to listen to some things you maybe didn't, um, haven't heard. So um, thanks a lot, Eric. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate it. We'll see you next time on Meet the Author.